guys, Cool Jibbelin here, and I know I'm a bit far away from you, but um, I just wanted to like relax back here, so I'll probably just turn the sound up later. So, um, it's kind of a vlog, but it's going to be political, I know it is, because um, that's the only thing I can kind of focus on right now. I don't know, yesterday was bad. It was, there were some good things, I saw, um, I managed to actually like reconnect with like um, one of my friends from, um, we've known each other since we were, we were little. It was just so good to like see her and talk to her, like it felt really good. And then, um, ugh, a terrible day after that, but um, yeah, so that's why if I look a bit out of it, like I haven't, I haven't really slept very much. Like my eyes actually feel like they're made of sand right now, so <laughs> I feel really scratchy. Um, but I just figured, you know, like put my makeup on anyway and just, you know, um, sometimes it can make you feel a bit better to put your makeup on and stuff like that. So yeah, if I like scratch my eyes a lot, they just, they feel so, so scratchy right now. They're quite bloodshot. Like I feel like I'm turning into a weeping angel. Like <laughs> honestly at this point, like <laughs> the weeping angels can come. Like I will close my eyes, like take me away. But no, I was, I was on Twitter. And I saw that Keir Starmer has done a cabinet reshuffle, and it's not good. I mean, I, you don't really need me to tell you that. Like, if you've seen my stuff before, you know what I think about this. But I'm really, really worried about this. I got into this, like, Twitter debate the other day, um, not to get at this particular guy, because I think he was a good person, and um, just, like, an example. I am so, so frustrated and actually afraid. It's, it's weird to even say afraid of the way that people who are willing for the, the Labour Party to kind of slip into the centre and play the Tories game just to be elected, which I don't personally think will work anyway, maybe it will, I don't necessarily think it will because I don't think you can out-Tory the Tories, and I'll talk about that in a minute with them, with some of the cabinet reshuffle, but also, I mean, what we're seeing happening is the reframing of the left, which is actually really quite the moderate left, just democratic socialism, being reframed as extremist, because, and I've seen this happen like in the last few years, because Jeremy Corbyn, I obviously, like, I really loved his manifest day. Sorry as well if I if I sound like I'm slurring a lot. Like I didn't I didn't sleep very well. Like it was just really bad. Like I I'm not really I don't know my my mind's not great right now. But I really liked his policy. It was a good democratic socialist like manifesto, and there were some things that I would change about it. But on the whole, like I thought it was a really great different vision for the future. But somehow, like and, and Corbyn wasn't that really like extreme. Like he he wasn't really. If you look at other like European countries and stuff, he wasn't really. He was just kind of like moderate. Like a lot of people said Corbyn was the compromise, and I, I agree with that because I think he was a way for us to have socialism within the system. And I know it sounds probably really stupid and dramatic, and I don't, I can only time will tell if it is dramatic or not. But I do feel like we're hitting a point where things are getting so bad, capitalism is getting so awful, global warming and climate change, um, refugees, people being displaced, wars, uh, fighting over resources and oil and colonialism, all that stuff. I feel like we're hitting this boiling point and something's going to have to give. And at some point, I don't know, I, I feel like it was almost, the, it was like, okay, this is the last chance we had. Um... And I don't know, I, I, when Kistama got elected, like, I, I was, you know, I don't know, I, I didn't really think he was, like, awful, he was more central than I wanted, but what's happened now has been the reframing of the left as quite extreme, and that's, I, I don't object to somebody being more central, you know, just being open and saying, right, okay, my politics are more central, but it's the reframing of the people who are, like, quite moderate left, being reframed as, like, these aggressive, dangerous people, which really worries me, because... Once you play into the Tories game with that, the next generation, even if by some miracle we do manage to do something and get rid of the Tories, they're going to be, they're going to go in, they're not going to, be able to do what they wanted to start with because they're going to have to start like reframing it all again, like putting it back to how it should be. Like the goalposts have been shifted so far that so much energy will have to be taken up even arguing for those things, you know, it feels like we're going to have to like regra regain so much ground. It just really worries me. But, um, you know, something that, like, you know, someone was, someone was saying was about how it's, it's like, responsible and, and, like, it's clever for Starmer to, like, move to the centre and to be against that is, like, letting the Tories win. And I'm not saying that I wouldn't vote for Labour. Like, I'm, I think when it comes to it, I'm going to have to go for... I think I might just have to do it. I think I might just have to just think the lesser of two evils situation. But I just I just wish it wasn't that situation. And for minorities to actually feel worried and to be told, oh, well, you know, you clearly want want things to get worse for people. No, I don't think I don't think that's true. And actually, I don't I don't even necessarily think that why would wanting the leader of the Labour Party like I, I honestly like at this point, I would put my own politics aside. I do mean that like 
there's some things I won't budge on, like racism, like the treatment of refugees, um, colonialism, those things. But, you know, I don't mind something more central, but I, I need a leader that I can trust is going to keep his word. At the very least, because if you're voting for somebody, like, I mean, people, some people are saying, well, you know, it's smart because he says this, he's going to go all central, and then suddenly he's going to go all left when he gets in. And that doesn't make sense to me for two ways, because first of all, it's just deceptive. And I don't think that's right. I don't think you should lie to get into power. No matter what your, how good your intentions are, I just don't think that's a good thing to do. And second of all, like, what, what makes people think that he would use that to shift to the left? Because when he was made um, leader of the Labour Party, he shifted it to the right. So, so I don't know why... I think people are, like, putting their own spins on, you know, th these motives. And I, I mean, to be completely honest, I just don't think it is that smart. I, I think we can see time and time again, it's, it's not as clever. Like, there's no master plan here. It's not working. Like, there, I don't even know if there is a plan at this point, or if it's just egos, or what. I don't know. But you know that the comment that was being made was about, like, um, you know, all politics... When I said, like, you know, to, to bring up the fact that, you know, at the very least, our politicians shouldn't lie. They should be able to admit if they promise something and they can't achieve it. But they, they certainly shouldn't lie about it to get elected. And, and suddenly these people are saying, well, it's okay because all politicians lie. First of all, I don't think that's true. I don't think all politicians do lie. And second of all, like, why would we accept that? Why wouldn't we hold them to a higher standard? Is that what things have come to? That it's just fine for politicians to completely just blatantly lie to people to get into power? Like, what kind of a system is that? You know, I was thinking about, like, that these people that do actually stick to their principles, so, obviously you know that I support Jeremy Corbyn, but somebody who I really support who's actually within the Labour Party is Zara Sultana, and, um, She's actually about my age. I can't believe how um, how brilliant she is, really. I mean, I don't know how she puts up with the, the scale of the sexism, the Islamophobic abuse, like the the racism, the way the system's rigged against her, you know, um, also because she's working class. There's so many things working against her. And something that really, really shocked me was reading that she said recently, and I'm like, I guess it's weird because I suppose you think of politicians as being stronger in some way. Maybe we shouldn't. But, you know, this this, this woman is my age. She's really normal, she's just a normal person, and Kistam hadn't contacted her once. He hasn't contacted her for over a year. But but we all know that she's been getting this awful, awful stuff. It's been quite public. So, what, what's going on? I, I just... I just need him to show in some small way that he does care about these things, and he's not just doing it for power, because I have to admit, it does scare me. You know, it scares me that, that, that someone could be in charge that's petty and who puts their ego before anything else. It really worries me. And, and I'm, not, I'm not even saying it's worse than the Tories in terms of policy. Morally it feels worse than the Tories because I think that I expect better from the Labour Party. I feel like the party's been hijacked. I feel like it's been hijacked ever since Tony Blair really, but, but you, you expect that of the Tories. Um, I, I expect that. You know, I know most of the time when Boris Johnson's lips are moving, he's lying. And he's, he's very clever with his positioning because he's somehow managed to avoid being judged as this elitist snob by crafting this persona where he's he's kind of all over the place, he's a bit of a shambles, you know, he, so he doesn't feel like he's talking down to people, it's very clever. And people say, oh, he's just he's just an idiot, he's a clown. I think it's I think it's just all a tactic. I think it's because he, he, he knows that he went to Eton and he had all these privileges. He doesn't want people to think about that. He needs to come across as like an oddbod. I'm outside the system, I'm one of you, you know, and, and it's clever as well, I think I said in another video, I won't get into it loads here, but like Preeti Patel, very smart, because she's more hard mind, she's more strict, and she's able to, to do that, that Boris Johnson can't, because she's a woman of colour, because she's from a family of immigrants, like, the Tories are, are very much on that, you know, I, I, it's not, they're not stupid, they're really not stupid, I, I find some of their, their views, it's not, it's not a lack of intelligence, it's just a lack of kindness and compassion for people, really. But I, you know, I, the, the phrase that was used about Zara Sultana was that, oh, she, she'll, be good in, she'll be good later on in life, not yet, because she courts too much controversy. And I was thinking about that and how victim lonely that does sound, you know, like just the, the phrase, I'm not, not to drag this, this poor person, this person is a good person. Um, they, they obviously just were playing, they wanted to play the game not out of bad intention, the intention was a hope that if the game was played, then maybe something would be salvageable. You know, it wasn't It wasn't coming out of badness. But, you know, the idea of courting controversy, and, and what what was that, essentially? Well, it was the fact that she stood up for Palestinians and said they had a right to resist. And, and are we really at that point, and do we want it to go further? 
that somebody's saying that an occupied country in apartheid, the people there who are having to go through checkpoints, they don't have the same rights, they're being bombed all the time, international laws being broken. Why is it caught in controversy to say that occupied people are allowed to fight back? Why is that controversial? And, and even to play into the idea that it is, is awful, because, because it's a bigger issue. If you look at the, the issue of Palestine and the people of Palestine, and also the people of Israel, because the longer this goes on, it will be, you know, there will be also innocent Israelis that are, that are caught up in it. Because obviously the Palestinians are going to fight back against occupation. And and it's going to go on and on and on. Like, the only way I can see it ending is, is if the Palestinian people have the right to return. If they're not occupied anymore. If it stops. But by casting that as controversial, just that... What's that? What's that doing globally for all these all these occupied places? What's that doing to Palestinians? Like, they this isn't a game. Like, this is this is people's actual lives, and I, I know it can be hard for us to think about because we're we're here. I say that like you could be from anywhere, but I, I don't think many of us are like obviously from Palestine. Like, if if you are, then solidarity, and I'm completely with you. But but while we play politics, it's like okay, we'll buy into that notion that it's controversial, and. Every day more people die. Every day more people die. And oh, it's what worried me as well about... Um, okay, so the, the Jeremy Corbyn... I will get into the Jeremy Corbyn thing. So he did an interview recently. I might read you a bit. It's been over a year now since he was suspended. And it just feels like the pettiest power trip. It, it's 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 really worrying. Um, I think his stomach was even called out on it. Like, I think he was doing an interview and someone said to him, look, you're actually banning a former Labour lead, lead, leader from standing. And it's like cutting off his nose to spite his face because Jeremy Corbyn's popular, he's going to win his seat. And honestly, they're quite, they're lucky really that he's such a, a, a decent person that he's not thinking about vengeance and suing them because he, you know, if I was him, I'd be furious. They're really quite lucky with the way he's dealt with this. All he's saying is that it doesn't make sense. It's unfair, it's illogical, it's irrational. And it's destroying party morale. It's, it's absolutely dividing everyone who needs to be united to get the Tories out. But Keir Starmer's ego, I guess. I don't know. And he keeps saying, you know, he knows what he has to do to get back in. And I'm presuming what, what he has to do is retract his comments where he said that in some cases the anti-Semitism um, situation was used factionally by bad faith actors. But that's... There's nothing wrong with that. We, we have a report that literally, in fact, let me, let me literally read you, let me read you this, okay? And again, like, it, it's fine to disagree with the report. I'm not saying you can't disagree with the report. Like, it's not that, like, some report is, like, the absolute be-all and end-all. But, Starmer is a lawyer, or was a human rights, rights lawyer, but he's, he's not following due process, as well as breaking his pledges. It, it just, it's not adding up. Okay, so it says here, Article 10 will protect Labour Party members who, for example, make legitimate criticisms of the Israeli government or express their opinions on internal party matters, such as the scale of anti-Semitism within the party, based on their own experience and within the law. It does not protect criticism of Israel that is anti-Semitic. So, Jeremy Corbyn's never denied anti-Semitism in the party. He said one anti-Semite in the party is one too many. Like, he's never said it's a lie, that it's made up. He said what I think I think is demonstrably true, that it's been used in bad faith, and not, not to say that it undermines the issue itself. But surely, we've seen the Tories use it politically to disguise from their own racism. We've seen left-wing Jewish people, Jewish members of the party, being suspended for anti-Semitism. How is, how is that instance not factional? Because what... What, what possibly could could be gained by that what why would you would you ban lifetime labor members who are jewish for anti-semitism it, it doesn't make sense so it, it has to be at some level being used factionally to get rid of those people not to say the issue doesn't exist of course the issue exists but it's being used just like anything else gets used in politics i don't think it's that crazy a notion really just like the way i've said before they obviously racism is something we should all abhor but they're also, the Tories are also using it very smartly with Preeti Patel because they're using it back on the progressives because they put Preeti Patel in charge of deportations and then it's like, okay, but this is a brown woman, this is an immigrant. So that, that's just how 
modern politics unfortunately is running maybe it's always been like that but maybe i just haven't realized but it is all very factional so so that's not even something that can be denied that's like demonstrably true as a thing that seems like a power trip from Keir Starmer. it really worries me I, I just think the sort of people that crave power are never the people that should have power ever and I, I do think that partly that's why Jeremy Corbyn was so popular, because I think he, he's been on the back benches for so long, he's, he's been fighting for various causes. If his aim was to take power from, like, the party, he, he never worked within the system. If he thought they were wrong, like with the Iraq war, he voted against that. And I'm not saying everything Jeremy Corbyn's ever thought or done is perfect, because it's not a cult. I'm just saying that somebody who, who is not thinking about their career, who is thinking about their principles first, it feels safer to me because at least you know what you're going to get. You know that when you vote for them, they're going to stick to what they believed in because they won't be bored. Because they haven't done that. And it just worries me. Sorry if the screen's jiggling, I just had to like fix something on the screen. But what I don't understand is that like, Tony Blair is still in, uh, presumably allowed in the party. I mean, I, I saw him being interviewed the other day. He was being interviewed on Good Morning Britain by Alistair Campbell. And, and with Susanna Reid, and I was watching a, a, a war criminal, in my view, being interviewed by his former spin doctor, so no bias at all there, talking about the reasonable left, you know, positioning himself now as the reasonable centre-left, uh, like the reasonable left, with Susanna Reid, who's basically Piers Morgan's complicit little sidekick. I'm not ashamed to say that's what I think of her, because in some ways, my, my personality... I think, I think people like Piers Morgan are worse, politically, but I also think that... For me personally, I, I at least feel a little bit of safety in knowing someone's bad. It's the ones that are just quiet and play good cop, but don't do anything and are secretly kind of enjoying it, that worry me the most, because you don't know where you stand with them. I kind of, I guess that's how I feel about, about Labour right now, because I know where the Tories stand. I can't, I hate them, not necessarily as people, but I hate what they, what they do and what they're doing and what they vote for and the way they treat people. I don't know where Labour stands right now. Like, I, I, I don't trust the people that are in charge of it. And it's just going to be a bit of a nightmare. It feels like an endless nightmare, really, because because even if they do make it in at this point, that's re that's the left now, isn't it? So this tory light, -like, uh, this whole thing they've started, which is, is just the Tories, but, like, it's just like how the Tories used to be before they got super... Mo they kind of got... They got more right-wing, and so Labour, for some reason, jumped right also. So, um... Obviously, when that doesn't offer solutions to uh, the economic problems and, and poverty and stuff, because the, the problem is capitalism. So a central party that isn't actually offering socialism isn't going to work. But because it's calling itself left, it's going to mean that less and less people get a chance to, to, to live happily or just live in general because people die. Because if that's what they think the left is, we've, we've not seen for a very, very long time, we haven't seen a modern socialist government, what they can do. Keir Starmer positioning himself as this, as this is, this is what Labour is. Positioning socialism as a fringe group. It just prolongs capitalism. Maybe it'll buy us some time. And I probably will vote for them as much as I hate to because it will buy time and I just want in, as many people to be as alright as possible. But in the long run even, it just feels very hopeless because it will swing back. It will swing back. And if that's already the norm, then Labour's going to jump again and again and again and again and again. And we're going to keep going further to the right. And one day Keir Starmer's going to find himself probably being regarded as a radical. Probably. Because it will shift so far. But this cabinet reshuffle, this kind of panic reshuffling because of how bad the polls are. Um, I'm not a politics student, but um, obviously I care a lot about social issues and all that kind of stuff. So I do try and like stay informed and I've like tried to be reading up on stuff. And I am concerned because even just the other day when I was having that you know these conversations with people I often do online and they seem to have a, a faith that it's going to be all right it's just an act he's only acting that way so that when he gets in he can be more left-wing and I think people maybe want to believe that maybe maybe they have guilt about electing him which wasn't their fault because he did position himself as the unity candidate there's, there's no shame in having voted for him he did say he would be the unity candidate but it's like he's he's trying to bring back the Blair years so he's trying to bring back new Labour and I think this is a huge misjudgment, because, yes, the party did get in, but that era, it just continued Thatcherite policies. I mean, Tony Blair was quite blatant about that. And even then, it's, it's to my mind, and I'm not a great political strategist, but just, just from my perspective, it doesn't even seem very smart. Because the public don't support Tony Blair in general. 
who in the public is clinging to Tony Blair other than these kind of bubble centrists? Ordinary people of, of, of different ends of the spectrum. Ask people what they make of Tony Blair in the Iraq war. So Yvette Cooper, I've, I've written some notes because I'll get this wrong otherwise, and also I have ADHD so I go off a bit. So she is going to be, she, she's Shadow Home Secretary now. So Home Secretary is the job that Preeti Patel currently has, so it's it's like in charge of um, immigration and policing, that kind of thing. Okay, so my heart kind of sank a little bit because he's, it's Yvette Cooper. Now this is Yvette Cooper who, let me just let me just write this down because I, I actually looked up the voting record for this because it really worried me. She voted for the Iraq war. She also voted against the investigation into the Iraq war. I'll get to the rest of her voting, but first of all, just on that topic, I can almost... People who voted for the Iraq war, I mean, you, you could argue that they just didn't think, you know, maybe they thought they were doing the right thing. Back in the day, people like Jeremy Corbyn were aware it was the wrong thing, did try to, he voted against it, which aids very well. But I can understand, you know, maybe um, people really thought it was the right thing to do. If that's the case, though, if I'm thinking of that in good faith, then why would you vote against an investigation? If you don't think there's any wrongdoing, and you think it genuinely was a miscommunication, and it was, I'm, I'm not saying that makes any sense as an argument, but if, if that's what people are saying, why vote against the investigation? Something's not adding up there. Like, that, that lack of accountability, that attitude to, to international affairs is dangerous in a Home Secretary. And then we've also got, so the other thing with Yvette Cooper is she's famous for the, um, the, the days of Ed Miliband when they had the, uh, the immigration controls, mugs, um, nightmare, absolute hellscape. And it seems we've gone back to that because basically she consistently votes for and wants tighter immigration controls. And her rhetoric is pretty damning and pretty dangerous. So, um, I think I've got some of it here. I'll just get it on the screen. Okay, so it says, how um, Yvette Cooper voted on home affairs. So she generally voted for stricter asylum, a stricter asylum system. There's various articles here, like I'll put them on the screen. Like I won't be able to monetize this because they're not my images, but you know, you need to see them. So pace of immigration under Labour was too fast, says Yvette Cooper. Yvette Cooper, talking about immigration is not racist. It is not racist to be worried about immigration. And, and that's smart because, I mean, technically, no, the, the talk talking about immigration isn't racist. But that, even that, that framing presents it as, oh, this is something we can't even talk about. It's like it's like that weird mentality, oh, they're cancelling Christmas. You can't even you can't even say Merry Christmas to someone now, or you get thrown in jail. Like it's 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 positioning, it's that weird sort of cancel culture victim situation, isn't it? As if you, you get cancelled for, for saying such things when actually our, our very government and policy is, is against immigrant immigrants. They don't have power. They're not in control here. Maybe maybe these people feel guilt in their souls. But that's just conscience. That's not nothing to do with power. I mean, th this is a speech that she made before. We believe action is needed to tackle the unfair impact of immigration. We know there are different types, different kinds of immigration, and it's not all bad, as conservatives would tell us. It's not all good, as liberals would tell us. So I, I really struggle with the idea that you're taking a central point on that, because immigration is not a bad thing. Why, why is immigration a bad thing? That's really worrying because immigration has made our country so great. Like, there's, there's so many things that they want us to think are brilliant about this country, like empire, patriotism, the queen, all that stuff. But one of the, some of the things that I genuinely do think are great about this country are almost, we almost don't deserve them because, you know, they're side effects of what our government or our British empire has done to our people. But because we colonised, because we went to places like India, because of Windrush, we did end up with a culture that was completely enriched by different cultures and different foods and different ideas. And I mean, it, even things like, like our Olympians, like all these things that we're so proud of, like like people who, who the, the scientists who were working on the vaccine, all these people, are people that, that came to us and enriched our lives. Like they, they run our NHS. Like my family came from India because of the whole colonization thing they end up coming here like immigration is not a bad thing why would we even buy into that notion if it feels like there's not enough to go around that's a valid feeling but what we know and politicians do know that the reason is not because of immigration or asylum seekers or refugees it's because we are one of i think we're like we're one of the richest economies in the world or, or certainly certainly we have i don't say that that somehow trickles down to normal people 
But we've got very, very rich people. There's wealth in this country. There's wealth here. Why? The question is, why is that not making its way down? Like, the, the people that live here should, they do have a right to be angry, because that should be reaching them. And once it's reached them, there should be then enough to say, look, immigration is, is a great thing, like, enrich our culture. It's a wonderful world if we can travel somewhere else and they can travel to us and we can live together and, like, mesh and, and create something new. Anyway, she goes on to say, stronger controls. Third, we, we want stronger controls. And yes, stronger controls are vital for a progressive approach. We will be bringing back fingerprinting for illegal migrants caught staying away at Calais, something the government has refused to do. So it's, it's basically criminalising migrants, refugees and asylum seekers. Because it, they, they say, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not really getting into this topic right now, but obviously they say, oh, well, econ economic migrants are different. And first of all, can I just say that even if that's your argument, we're not taking enough refugees and asylum seekers anyway. So it's not a case of, oh, we let in all these other people so you can't come. Like, we're, we're not allowing people to even claim asylum. There's a legal right to claim asylum, but we're not, we're not letting them get here. We're not even letting them have that right, which is their right. And, and especially, don't even get me started on the fact that most of these people are from countries that, that they're not just coming from nowhere. We've usually had a hand in their histories, you know, that they're not just randomly coming here. But also the idea that, like, you know, economic migrants and stuff, but she also says in this speech, she talks about young men camping by the roadside and leaping into the wheel arches of passing lorries to be crushed and killed. Does that sound like somebody who's just on a bit of a jolly and just thinks, oh, I'll have an easy life? Honestly speaking... Do you think that these people, these people know they're the same as us. We've all got the same, like, capacity to think and feel and love and, and, and be afraid of things. What would it take for us to do something like that? Knowing, knowing that people are getting crushed doing that. Knowing people are drowning. It's, it's just a, such a sick reframing. Like, that's not, that, that's not someone who's just, who's just here for a, for an easy ride, is it? You don't sacrifice your whole life in those conditions for that it's insane to even to even go along with that framing and the fact that this supposed shadow home secretary believes that it's not even so she's going up against Priti Patel who's basically like the master of evil like right like, even in in that worldview so even if Keir Starmer's thought with his big brain well okay well the tabloids seem to think that the people they don't like immigrants, so we're going to go along with the tabloids. And don't get me started on the way that he's like courts the tabloids. Like everyone goes on about like people like Zara Sultana like courting controversy. This man is working with the Sun. He's working with the Sun paper. But even with that, even if that's in, maybe he's thinking right, okay. So in his mind, he's got an image of what the average Joe is, right? And he thinks that we're all idiots anyway. So he thinks we're all completely stupid, and he thinks that we believe everything the tabloids tell us. So he needs someone who's going to be tough on immigration. But yet again. This doesn't make sense to me, because being a red Tory, if people really, really hate immigrants, and they've been stirred up to hate immigrants, and they feel that way, if they have the option, in that situation, of going for someone like Priti Patel, or Yvette Cooper, who actually agrees with the whole thing, but probably won't be as harsh, who are they going to vote for? Like, it really, it doesn't make sense to me, like, it doesn't make any sense, because, seriously, what, why would they choose that? If you're somebody who, for example, Maybe you love chocolate, right? You just love chocolate, and there's one politician who's saying, okay, well, I'm gonna let you have chocolate at every meal. And then another politician who wants to get in on the action somehow says, well, you can't have it at every meal, but we'll probably let you have it at lunchtime. Who would you vote for? Like, it doesn't make sense. This is why Labour needs to run based on principles and policy not to move to what's popular all the time, because the Tories are laughing. The Tories are just moving us further and further and further away, because now we've got Yvette Cooper versus Priti Patel. If that's the left, if the opposition is that, there is no opposition, is there? Like, th there's no opposition. And again, I would, I would prefer, if I, had to, if I had to choose between them, obviously I'd prefer Yvette Cooper to Priti Patel. Do I feel comfortable with that? Do I feel happy about it? No, I think I'd feel dirty afterwards. I think I'd feel... You don't want to have to come away from, from your vote feeling sick and complicit and, like, you've had to choose between these two awful positions. It's horrible. And again, like, I'm not a politics student, but I try to, like, um, look into this. So I try to do... I do try to keep informed. So what we have here is that... So Yvette Cooper actually abstained on the hostile environment bill. So 
this was under Theresa May. So let me just like read to you the hostile environment bill because I'm not a politics student, so it's better if I just read this. And also, I'm sorry, this is Wikipedia. There's better ways to do this, but it's just easier. Okay, so the UK Home Office hostile environment policy is a set of administrative and legislative measures designed to make staying in the United Kingdom as difficult as possible for people without leave to remain in the hope they may voluntarily leave. So this is directly... First of all, it's completely immoral. It's, it's really... I would call it quite evil, like I try not to call people evil, but the idea itself is really evil. It's like, to this day, the Windrush generation are still, are still fighting for compensation, to be treated like, like they belong to a country that they were invited to and they helped to build. And they gave us, they gave us so much more than we ever gave them. They worked here, they lived here, they enriched our culture, and then we treat them like that. And so this, this shadow home secretary, didn't even feel strongly enough on that to vote. And I'm asking you, I mean, I was kind of mocked online, you know, when, when they say, when you try and say that you're fearful, not in a dramatic sense, but just kind of constantly worryingly, like, feeling like this wheel is turning and turning and turning and it's a bit unstoppable at this point, and it just feels scary. Not because of the right now. Like, we're not, I, I can't speak for anyone else, but like, I'm not, I'm not saying that tomorrow it's gonna go full fascist immediately. I think every single day, every single day, it will go a little bit further, a little bit further, a little bit further, because it already is. If you think about some of the weird stuff that's coming out now, like the idea that Preeti Patel can, Preeti Patel can strip your citizenship without telling you, and that that's a thing that that isn't even a big, it's not really even a big a big deal to people, you know, like the police bill. Like I know people complained about it, but it's forgotten now because there's there's so much other stuff happening all the time. And I, and I ask you, I ask you truly, and I'm, I'm not saying that I'm not going to vote Labour. I feel like I'm... Part of me wants to be like, no, I'm not going to because I'm really angry. I am really, really angry about it. But I think, oh, I, I, I think part of me is thinking, I might just have to do it. I'm going to hate doing it, but I might have to do it. But I'm also... That doesn't mean that I, I, I can't then stop criticising and pushing for it to be better because... If that's our opposition, we're all we're all lost. The hope of socialism in the future is gone, and it's it's a terrible situation. And even the fact it's being put on minorities now, saying to minorities, "Well, if you don't vote, the Tories will get in, and it's your fault." When, for example, trans people and members of the Gypsy Roma traveller community, you know, the Windrush generation, ethnic minorities, people who are dual nationals, all these people that are scared, people with, with immigrants in their families, people who, who feel compassion for refugees. Oh, the, the disability benefit thing, that's another thing from Yvette Cooper. It's her actions have actively, and I, I don't mean this in a dramatic sense, I don't want any harm to come to anybody, but, but at what point are we going to be able to say that these decisions that these politicians make about people who they don't understand Yvette Cooper isn't someone who relies on disability benefits to live. What she did there, making it more difficult, making it so, um, let me find it. Right, so it says, there's, a, there's it's an independent article, but um, I'll just I'll just put it on the screen. But, um, right, so make it harder for migrants to receive job seekers allowance, says Labour's Yvette Cooper. Foreign workers should not be allowed to claim child benefit for youngsters living abroad. Nice, okay. So, and directly, right, Yvette Cooper directly played a part, and I can't emphasise this enough, okay. So with the ESA, so it's the Employment Support Allowance, so it's people who um, might be, I think, I, okay, I'm not a politics student, but it's, it's obviously something that people need because they can't work or they're looking for work. So it's people who are the most vulnerable in our society, really, isn't it? And she, she approved the idea of making it harder to pass for disabled people. So some of those examples here, okay, to make it more simple, more black and white, to stop giving money to these people, was... Docking points from amputees who can lift and carry with their stumps. Claimants with speech problems who can write a sign saying, for example, the office is on fire. Claimants who can read the sign will lose all their points for hearing. Claimants who have difficulty standing for any length of time under the plans also have to show they have equal difficulty sitting and vice versa. No matter how bad their problems with standing and sitting, they will not score enough points to be awarded ESA. And at what point do we say that this is evil? This is evil. I try not to call people evil, but what... What world are we living in when we're talking about people, somebody who, who can't stand, right? Somebody who, and, and I obviously, we know about disability. Like I talk about disability on this channel, mostly um, like uh, mental illness and that kind of thing, which is disability, because that's what I, I have. So, you know, those struggles, it's already difficult enough. 
to, to get any support on that. But, but the idea as well that somebody who can walk a very short distance, only a tiny bit, only sometimes, because obviously we know with disability you have good days and bad days. That's just how it works. And yet to turn that against them like there's some criminal, like, oh, well, okay, you stood for a little bit, therefore it's fine. You've had your arms amputated, but you can, you can still carry things. And it's, it's treating these people like they're subhuman. It makes you feel ashamed and like, it, it honestly, it sickens me because this is, it's all very well to say be kind and to say like, get talking about mental health and physical disability and all those vulnerabilities that we have. But our very society treats us like we're subhuman, like we don't deserve to live, like we have to prove that we're worthy of being alive, like they're trying to catch us out. They're trying to catch us out and say, there you go, you're a cheat you're not getting anything, like, not a home, not enough food, not heating. And these are people who are already struggling with disability and mental health issues, and it's, it's evil and it's wicked, and it's murder. I will openly say that it's murder. Um, that probably sounds dramatic, but that's, that's the reality. And, and I wonder how many people with these difficulties would be so much better anyway if they weren't treated like burdens by the very system itself. If those people are supported and they've got enough money to live on, they can help. They can they can be campaigners. They can talk about their experiences. But they, I mean, they don't even have to do that. Like, people are just worthy of being alive. People are, are. It shouldn't be in this country that anyone is is deemed unworthy of shelter, and food, and warmth, and being able to keep a roof over their head. And also, I'm sorry, this is long, but David Lamy has been promoted to shadow foreign secretary. So, I mean, just looking at, at his his voting record, like, the, these are the people that Keir Starmer, this, Keir Starmer is showing us, like, there's that quote, isn't there, about, like, when people show you who they are, like, believe them, believe them the first time. This man isn't going to do, like, some magic shift to the left. I know people have hope, he's not, he's not, that's not what it's about. It's, I'm sh it can't be, because it doesn't make sense. David Lammy's voting record on home affairs, he voted for a stricter asylum system. Both he and Yvette Cooper voted for introducing ID cards and more surveillance, so less less freedoms. And in contrast, for example, with someone like Jeremy Corbyn, and this is this is what I just can't forgive. The monstering of this man who voted against stricter asylum system, who voted against ID cards, who voted that we shouldn't have gone to war in Iraq, and that there should be an investigation, and that people should get benefits and be treated like actual human beings. And again, like, I'm not saying that the party has to have the politics of Jeremy Corbyn, he's not the leader anymore. But what I can't forgive is the monstering of him, making him into some sort of extremist. Because it's not even just about Corbyn. That's not what it's about. Everyone was afraid because of, of what he stood for. And people, for a moment, they seemed to, like, wake up. So he had to be destroyed. Because people started to realise that it was rigged. The whole thing was rigged. That man can be called a racist and an anti-Semite. A terrorist sympathiser. Dangerous. And I mean, just to think, Jeremy Corbyn, dangerous. It's ludicrous if you if you even think about it. It's it's like this is a man who probably is 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 too too pacifist for his own good sometimes. But he's he's dangerous. Zara Sultana is controversial. She's dangerous, and I can't help but think there's a slight um, there's a racial undertone there, not a deliberate one. But of course, a young Muslim woman of color, a working class woman, is going to, to is going to believe these things because that's her life. She's not playing a game. To demand that of her, to be electable, is sick. Why are we playing into that? There's people like Blair. I've never heard Starmer go in on Blair the way he does on Jeremy Corbyn. And who's the one who's caused so many millions of deaths? Who's caused... Jeremy Corbyn's called a terrorist sympathiser. But how much terrorism and destruction was created because of our intervention in the Middle East? All the pain and the suffering, and I believe Tony Blair's a war criminal, you might not, that's fine, but at the very least, so many people died. And whether, whether people care about that because of the intervention and the pain caused to the Iraqis, the, the, the destabilisation of the Middle East, the power, or, or whether it's coming from people who are patriotic and, and, and feel very greatly for our soldiers that were killed unnecessarily, for this war over nothing. <laughs> this war over, over nothing. These young people, usually young working class people, sold this myth that they're going to go out there and be heroes. And for what? That man has caused so much suffering. So many people in this country feel that very strongly. But Kiss Dharma will just, will, you know, he doesn't have a thing to say about him. Of course not. Of course not, because he's not a threat. He's not a threat to the system. Tony Blair's part of the system. Kiss Dharma's part of the system. They have to attack people who are outside of the system. That's why the Tories don't attack Kiss Dharma. 
have you noticed that they just can't seem to be bothered? Like, does that not ring alarm bells to anybody? Because every day they were trying to get Jeremy Corbyn because they were afraid of him. They didn't even... I don't think they, they even think about Keir Starmer. I think they probably would have trouble recalling his name. Oh, God, it's an awful situation. But I'm sorry, this is so much longer than I thought it would be, and it's probably not... Um, it just probably wasn't make that much sense, so... Um, yeah, I just wanted to make it. Like, I've been having, I don't know, a bad time yesterday. It was pretty bad. Like, I did I did get to, like, get in contact with my friend, but um, I guess focusing on politics and stuff helps in the sense that it makes me feel like there is still some some point to, to having a voice and, and being around and, and keeping track of this, um, even if hardly anyone watches it. Um, I don't know, at least... I just, I want to be more, like, um, you know, I think about Sarah Sultana a lot. Um, and I, I just think I want to be more like that. So, um, yeah. All right. Um, I love you loads. Um, I said in my last video, but I've got a new peer box now. So, um, I'll put the link in the description box if you want to, um, uh, write to me. Um, if you want me to write back, then put a stamped address envelope, uh, in there so that I, I, I have ADHD, so I struggle with all that organisation. But, um, yeah, so I, I will be happy to write back to you or, um, I can do like a Christmas card or a holiday card, depending on what you celebrate. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have to write back. If you just want to write, you can just write. Um, you know, any, anything like that. Um, it, it's just nice to hear from people. It's really nice. Um, and I will, I will definitely write back to you. So, um, Dan and I are making a video soon as well, so that'll be good. I'm sure I'll feel better when, I always feel better when I'm with Dan. Like, sometimes things feel really bad, but then, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm with Dan and I think, you know, um, everything's going to be all right. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I won't give up hope. Um, I, I almost kind of, in different aspects felt like I would, but um, there's no point, because it doesn't help anyone, does it, to give up hope, so I guess just keep uh, following what they're doing and keeping track of it, because they're going to keep trying to change, like, uh, move the goalposts, at least it's a record, anyway. Um, Alright, I love you loads, and I'll see you really soon. Bye!